Welcome to the online launch session, Database as a Service Exascale Preview. I'm very happy to be able to attract such a large number of participants for this session. We have prepared some exciting topics for you. After the intro and overview by COO and co-founder Antoine Coissier, we get into the topic Database as a Service, Benefits of Database as a Service, with my well colleague Hans Berndl. And as a special guest, Aria Lampelia, who is joining us from our partner, Avon. I don't want to anticipate and leave the explanations to our speakers later on. After this part, Dennis Arns will show a hands-on live demo. And finally, we will answer your questions in a Q&A session. I would now like to hand over to COO and co-founder Antoine Couissier, who oversees the business and operational aspects of the Exascale platform with his 20 years of experience in the service provider business. I hope you enjoyed this online session. The stage is yours, Antoine. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Ben. Um, thrilled to, to have you back here on, on stage uh, for this second uh, big announcement for, for 2021. We, we came in earlier with a, a series of webinars also on the, regarding uh, uh, our Kubernetes platform. Uh, so that's uh, launched. And our second big milestone for this year is uh, coming with um, database services. Um, so I, I'll just take a few minutes to talk to you uh, about what's uh, new uh, at, at Exoscale and what's coming up next. Uh, and then hand over to uh, to my colleagues. Um, so please, next slide. What's new uh, during uh, the, this first uh, half year at Exoscale? So, I mean, two two things we achieved um, recently, uh, which I would like to mention. Uh, Exoscale is now um, part of the OCRE uh, cloud catalog. This means that um, with uh, three of our partners, um, the whole European research and education uh, community can um, easily um, purchase and launch uh, resources on um, ex any of the uh, six exoscale zones in um, in Europe. So it was a, a great effort and a, a very nice uh, uh, tendering process uh, we went through with our partners and we are really happy to to have made the, the, the cut. So if you want more details, just go to ocre-project.eu and you can find the cloud catalog in which Exoscale is a, is a member of. Um, second thing, much more recent, so um, SKS fully live and GA since uh, February this year. Um, already um, a very nice uh, adoption rate from our customers. Uh, we see a very nice split of uh, uh, pro versus uh, uh, starter clusters. Um, what we achieved recently is the uh, confirm con that Exoscale SKS is now uh, part of the certified Kubernetes programs. So this is something that the uh, CNCF, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, uh, provides and brings the guarantees that the Kubernetes platform is consistent with the experience that you would find from a vanilla Kubernetes, that a platform is updated timely, and we've shown and we expose our um, uh, lifecycle management policy in the documentation. So uh, do refer to that if you want to learn more about the, how we deal with minor and uh, major versions. And then also is the conformance, meaning that uh, if you have a workload that mean, that runs uh, smoothly on uh, uh, on one uh, certified Kubernetes from another vendor and want to move it to Exoscale SKS, you should uh, not run into major problems and everything should run out of the box. Uh, so thanks for to our teams uh, having uh, achieved that. It's a, it's a great recognition from uh, from the industry. Um, what's coming up next? Uh, set of uh, things. So the next item on the roadmap after this uh, announcement and presentation you'll see today will be uh, SSO Federation. It was one of the required elements for the OCRE 
uh, full conformance, um, but we also have more and more requests from our enterprise customers uh, to I mean, integrate single sign-on with their uh, with their authentication platform. So that's coming uh, in the in the months to come. We will also continue uh, announcing more data services. Uh, so stay tuned with us, and that's a very nice cue to already set. Uh, uh, save the date with you for the continuation of this webinar series on September 7th. Um, last note before I end uh, over the stage, I would like to thank all the early adopters that uh, participated in the uh, Database as a Service uh, uh, program and provided feedback. It's, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, to become one of our early adopters, reach out to your um, uh, sales rep, to your uh, cloud architect uh, of reference, and uh, we'll discuss about it. Um, it's, a, I think, it's a really a win-win uh, situation. Uh, please do keep in touch, Twitter uh, at Exoscale, uh, the newsletter or changelog. This is, I mean, choose your channel to receive uh, updates from, uh, uh, like this one. Uh, we're doing, or you can also always reach out to sales at exoscale.com uh, anytime. Uh, thank you for your attention and participation today. Um, and I'll hand over the stage to Ernst. Yeah, welcome back to our webinar series. I'm really excited to take you on a journey for the next 30 minutes, literally to time and space, and discuss with you or get you to the point where you see the benefits of, of database as a service, hopefully. And as usually, I structured my talk with some guiding questions, um, as you have read already in the agenda. Why databases? Why manage databases? And why Exascale database as a service? So we, why do we need databases? Why is everyone looking for managed databases? And why is database as a service the answer to all those questions? I, I would like to tr to solve those questions and, and give you some guidance around that. Um, let's jump right into it, to our first stage, why databases? And it all starts with data. Yeah, data is the fuel of our society. Uh, it's not a quote I found everywhere. It's, it's, it's that what popped into my head when I was starting putting together that content and thinking about um, the topic. Because if you if you look at it, data is everywhere and we, we store it in all different means in all different categories and, and, and schemas. And and we, we really produce a lot of data. Uh, I pulled this uh, statistics and if you look at it, what, what we do or will produce this year in 2021, it's 79 zettabytes. That brings up the question, what is a zettabyte? Um, you can probably look it up in Wikipedia and, 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 and look at it. Uh, a zettabyte is a one with 21 zeros afterwards. Uh, and if you look at the other, probably more common terms like megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, we are pretty accustomed to it. Some of us probably deal already with petabyte. Exabyte is, mm, yeah, a league of its own, but Zettabyte is, is mind blowing. And if you look at our situation in 2021, there are 70.9 billion people on the planet and we produce 79 Zettabytes, which means uh, statistically every person produces 10 terabyte. And if you would take the, the largest disk, single disk available, which is 20 terabytes, so two people on, on the planet could put their the data on such a disk. I tried something different to really, because it's it's really hard to imagine this amount of, of data. And, and I have done that before, so I, I do a little bit of an experiment to visualize that. Um, I, I take a very old media. Some of you probably have worked with it. Uh, some have to look it up what it is. It's a floppy disk from the, from the old days. Uh, you only can store 1.44 megabytes on it. And I took our solar system as an as an reference system. And if you really start saving those 79 zettabytes on floppy disk and building a stack, uh, one flop is 3.3 millimeter thick. And if you do that, you get a pretty impressive stack of disks, which go beyond our solar system. It goes beyond roughly 40 times. 
uh, and point somewhere into space uh, at 181 billion kilometers. Yeah, that's impressive. And maybe that gives you more of an idea how much data we are talking about. And if you have so much data, you have to get into control uh, and making some out of it. So there are many value change around data. So it's not only about the production, but also about, about the usage of data. And as we know from recent years, there are companies built on data like Uber or Airbnb. And if you, if you look in those companies and their business, they are platform business really purely based on data. And you compare them to their competitors in the area like the, the taxi business or the, uh, the hotel business, uh, they're really fierce competitors without owning any property. So they're really based on data and bringing people searching for something and people providing something together uh, based on data. So data is, is a business and to make that business happen, you need the right tools and the tools are databases. Databases are not an invention of, of modern times. Databases are around for basically since the dawn of mankind, uh, at least at that time where we developed some uh, alphabet and, and writing skills because um, this clay tablet Sumerian is probably 3000 years old and has information about the most important prescription medicine of that time. So it was a very important database and databases like these card catalogs, maybe some of you experienced in, in, in libraries, are other types of databases. What they do have in common is the, the way they organize the data. It's, a, it's kind of a flat file model. And at the beginning of the 60s, we built machines to, to handle those type of databases based on, on flat files. And to make it scale, it's easy. You just build a bigger machine or an even bigger machine. But to some extent, that is a scaling model that doesn't work out pretty well. So in, in time, we thought about dealing with data differently. So coming up with different data models. And one was, for example, the hierarchical model, uh, which made the handling of data more efficient and enabled us to put a man on the moon in 1969. A year later, probably more, uh, important event with, with less media attention took place. In 1970, a white paper was published by Ted Cord about another model, which still has a lot of influence today, the relational model and how to organize and, and deal with data. And at that time, IBM had a database in place, which was their hero product based on the hierarchical model, the IMS. And regarding their uh, marketing materials, it was for yesterday, today, and maybe forever. So this rational idea had really hard time to come to use. Five years later, IBM did an experimental uh, relational database management system called System R. But this relational model got, got a lot of attention in, in academia and also in the industry. And um, a guy you probably know put $2,000 uh, from his own money to found a company, you probably also know Oracle, with the goal to produce the first um, um, commercial database, rational database compatible to the system R so that it could run on those mainframes and mini computers of the time and later on also on, on other types of computers. And this industrialization of databases changed the software dramatically, the, the, the software we use and the software, how we use it today. So that was a, a quick glance in database history. And if we, if we go back and categorize that a little bit, so before the 60s, there were all non-computerized database models going back in time. And in the 60s, the first computerized database models appeared. The 70s was the dawn of the database. The 80s was the industrialization of databases. The 90s, a lot of additional models, ideas came in and sh technologies were shifting. Uh, which lead to the 2000s where new players came into place, picking up on those technologies, implementing, improving them. And today is all about the involvement and adoption of databases. And what we see, we see also a glimpse of the future today that more and more specifically customized databases for certain problems are developed. Time series databases is one, one extent of that, for example, to have the right tools for the problems we are facing around data. 
and also the interaction with databases over time changed dramatically. So if if we if we glimpse back at the beginning of the 60s, we had those fancy terminals, very clear structured applications to work uh, with those databases and dedicated rooms to access those databases. And uh, retrieving the data was also almost always uh, kind of connected with loud printers and got printouts of the data on paper. Today, that looks quite differently. Uh, you can sit in a cozy uh, lifestyle uh, coffee shop with your terminal of choice, which is probably a smartphone and access hundreds of databases at the same time. And still, if you have the need to go back to those dinosaurs, you, you find the right app to do that on your modern terminal. So yeah, database access is still a topic, even though it has changed in style and look and feel, it's there. So why using computerized databases anyway. So what's, what's, what's the big deal about it? Um, because it makes a lot easier. For example, sorting data, searching and finding data, adding the data, editing, deleting, storing large sets of data in an efficient way. That's going back to the different uh, models we, we developed over time. Accessing data at the same time by multiple users, which is kind of feels normal for us. But if you, if you think back, pre-computerized databases like the card catalog. If five students try to access the same draw at the same time to pick out the same data set, it's kind of busy and kind of not so easy. Uh, computer databases make, make that a way easier uh, than in the old days. And importing and exporting data from and to other applications, so all this data transfer um, is another very important point which can be handled by databases. So every technology, as we know, has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, and if you want to apply it, you have to balance those. So let's look on, on the bright side, on the advantages. Yeah, data sharing, security, abstraction, concurrent access. We have heard that before. Manipulation in any way of the data. Uh, having multiple views on the data. So that's a glimpse towards data warehousing and all the, those notions that have come over time data redundancy controlling, inconsistency minimizing. So all this data quality assurance, uh, uh, which can be incorporated into database technologies. Have to be balanced against the cost of the software, cost of the hardware, stuff you probably need if you run your databases, uh, data conversions, make your databases because they are so important, high available, it's a complexity you have to deal with and a very important task in, in general in, in IT, backup and restore, and, and that could be quite complex in the database area as well. So that's, we have to balance against those advantages and that's what we do. Uh, so databases are here to stay and databases will, will evolve and there are more and more database technology. So that leads to another question, which database should I use? That's, that's not an, an, an easy question if you think about it. And there's a lot of guidance out there. And if you if you research that, like I've done, you you end up with a lot of passwords uh, around models and theorems and what you can use to decide which is the best database technologies. And if you pick one of that, which is around for 21 years, was published in 2000, the CAP theorem, which should help you to decide what you would get out of your network shared data system. And what's important for you? Is it consistency? Is it availability? Is it the partition tolerance? And uh, the theorem describes you can only have two out of three. Uh, you may you have to make a trade off. And then people started to match database technologies to, to those different uh, constellations. Uh, but it doesn't work for everything. You know, there's a lot of debate around that theorem as well. So it's, it's not something you can uh, apply everywhere and it doesn't solve all your problems. Then there are other database consideration approaches out there. So based on which type of data do I want to store and process? Is it structured data or is it um, unstructured data or any, any blend of that in between? So we need a, a more sophisticated model. We need, a, we need a better checklist to to pick out the right database technologies. And I came up with this checklist. Uh, not really, uh, I found a good book 
an incredible good book because I was researching a lot of books and you find books on specific databases, on specific models, on, on specific approaches, but you, you don't find so many on getting an overview of all those topics. And it's it's structured in this, this 12 chapters. Um, and the clever man who did that was this is Martin Kleppmann, a researcher and lecturer of University of Cambridge. He's also a speaker in many conferences. And he had support from some artists because he really basically literally did a map with all those topics. And if you look at that and in, in the book and, and, and zoom in, it, it, it's really nicely done. And I will show it to you. So the, the first step is about all the, the basic components, caches, databases, indexing, and, and all that stuff. And then you jump into certain topics like data models and query languages. What do you know about that? And what should you know in selecting the right tool for your task? Um, or storage and retrieval processes, um, encoding um, mechanisms, or everything about replication if you do a distributed um, database. Uh, partitioning is another topic um, you should research and, and think about it, as well as transactions, uh, distributed systems, and more the, the trouble and the, the challenges with distributed systems. So some considerations about that as well. Then uh, consistency of your data as a topic on its own, uh, handling a lot of data, so doing the batch processing or MapReduce or distributed file systems. Uh, and then one of the last chapters that is about stream processing, kind of data warehousing in real time and without moving data a lot big deal around uh, in your data centers. So stream processing is something new, but very powerful. And the last chapter of guidance is around uh, the future and things you should consider like privacy, security, data integration, and getting the future of, out of data, like with predictive analytics and, and such application of database technology. So that's a big map uh, you can travel and that should help you in decision making um, of picking the right technology. Why did I spend so much time on that? And if you like the map, there's the link below where you, where you can find it. Because I wanted to make one very specific point. It's complex. You have to put a lot of thought in the process of picking the right technology. And another important part in using the technology is running the technology. So, and, and that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And I prefer specialists like, like in Formula One, uh, you have those teams that change the tires and they can do it in seconds. These are specialists, they are trained for that. Uh, if you do it on your own, you probably can't do it in, in seconds. So why manage databases? Why manage the databases? It's because of you can make things simpler. And if you're not in the data center business like we are providing scalable, reliable, secure services, um, then you should think about it if you really want to go down that road and, and take care of all those things uh, to make that database technology really work for you. So managed databases simplify the task associated with provisioning and maintaining a database. That doesn't mean that you don't know have to know anything about databases at all. You still need some experiences working with databases to build and scale your apps with those technologies. But all this tedious task behind it. Uh, you can forget about it. And it's not only the task, uh, if you break the task down, uh, you have this, this traditional um, thinking and consideration when you go towards managed services or cloud services to a certain extent, CapEx versus OpEx. So if you have the infrastructure topics like the machine, the storage, uh, your ingress, egress, your different infrastructure technologies like Kubernetes clusters, the nodes, the load balancers, the software licenses you have to deal with in, in infrastructure and, and database terms. Um, the operations aspect, like the, the human capital involved, the, the, the opportunity management. So spending the time on my business or spending the time operating the stuff, that's that's a big difference. And if you can spend the time on your business, it's probably better also for your customers and, and supporting that technology. The domain expertise you need to run it really prof professionally um, it, it has to be considered. Yeah? It, and if you're not storing nuclear access codes or access codes to a level four hazard lab, you should really think about it if you're all 
those tasks want to be done on your own. So the decision between self-hosted versus managed is, is could be brought down to the database decisions alone, because otherwise you have to think about your servers, which CPU, which RAM, which RAM configuration, which this technology, uh, which size of disks, uh, and if you want to scale that, how I put that in racks, racks of server, how do I manage the racks of server? And then comes the database technology and it should be redundant, it should be reliable, so I have to cluster the technology. So if you can get rid of all that, your life is certainly much, much easier. Um, another aspect I found in my research that databases, like in the old days, you, the database defined the app, so and you have your terminals and you access the database. Applications today look a little bit different and they, they make use of database technology in a, in a, in a different way. If you, if you look at the diagram, which is also out of my, my, my favorite book uh, for the topic, you find four different database technology. You find a primary database where all the data is stored and you find an in-memory cache that makes the application faster in providing the, the results of the database. Then you have a full text index, which is kind of improving the search capabilities of your application to find the stuff quicker and message queues for some uh, asynchronous task or uh, other improvements of your application. So you're ending up suddenly with four different database technologies and you should run those four database technology that you can provide, uh, can, can provide those services to your application. So that's, that's also, I think it's challenging. So the evolution I'm, I'm talking about and, and where the, the promised land is, is on the, on the right hand side, it's database as a service because self-hosting, I think I made the point, it's, it's complex and if you're not in the data center business, it could be a challenge. Um, getting managed databases is, is way better, but if you get them from, from different providers, you still have a, an, an integration challenge. So getting all those services and more from through a single pane of glass, that's really, interesting and leads to our third stage question why exascale database as a service um, we provide you with scalable reliable cost-effective managed database solutions uh, all of a wide range of open source databases wait a minute just open source yeah it's it's open source and it's not just open source because if you if you look at the trend uh, the market is changing. So commercial licensed databases, which probably all st stick still to our head and uh, the names are singing and ringing in our ears, are declining. And open source is not only defining the way it goes in software in other areas, but also in the database field. So open source licensed databases are increasing. And if you look at the diagram, it looks like the 2021 is another important year. So the insection point could be reached of those technologies that open source license databases overtake the traditional commercial licenses model. So yes, open data, open source databases are a good thing and that's why we focused on that and providing those services. And the benefits are in short, quick start, so you can start a database within minutes, then as we'll show that later, uh, and focus really on your application. The open source thing I just mentioned, yeah, it, it, it opens up a variety of database technologies. We start today with, with four available and it's fully managed. It's, it's like checking in in a five-star hotel. You, you drop everything, you can enjoy your stay and everything else is handled by the hotel. Same, same is true for database as a service. It's fully managed. The benefit of open source is not only that you are in the, in the leading car and, and you are a trendsetter and going with the trend, you also have the benefit of not being locked in by any vendor, which, which happens still today. It's not a, a thing of the past with mainframes. It's still happening today, vendor login. And many customers who have experienced that in the past are not really eager to have that experience anymore. Daily backups are core, and we take care of that as well. The complete integration of those varieties of database technologies from one platform is a, is a really fine thing. Uh, you only can benefit from. Uh, another thing, which has nothing to do with the technologies and databases, it goes down to the, the compliance and legal part, which have to be considered, we have to be uh, uh, investigated today. So GDPR compliance is nothing you can set aside. 
your data stay in Europe. It's it's operated out of European zones, um, and you don't have to worry about those nasty GDPR compliant topics if you pick that services catalog with us. Um, you can automate everything via portals, command lines, APIs, and, and other tools of your liking. And we provide, uh, together with our partner, a very, very respectful uh, service level agreement of 99.99 availability of database clusters, which makes sure that the service is available when you need it for your customers. Um, I mentioned partner. Um, even is our partner and I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of teamwork. So teamwork makes the dream work. And in that case, it's Avon and Exascale. Avon is specialized on data infrastructure based on open source. We are specialized on core cloud infrastructure based on open source. And together, we are GDPR compliant uh, and provide a no vendor lock in service. I could try to explain the benefits of Avon, but I'm in the lucky position that I have an expert today which can help me out. And Avon plus Exascale is, is the winning team. And please welcome with me our special guest, Ari from Avon to the stage. And he will take that part from me and will explain what Avon brings to the table and what are the benefits and the values which we share, but which are also bringing um, a very interesting service catalog to your usage. Ari, the stage is yours. Thank you, Hans. Could I have the next, please? <clears throat> so we are we are super happy to announce the partnership with Exascale. Uh, we uh, at Ivan, like Hans already said, we are we are we are focused on changing the tires. That was the analog. So we really specialize in uh, productizing uh, open source based data and data streaming services. So the intent really is to take. Uh, any manual work away from everything on, on all the tasks and automate everything. Automation really creates the abilities for us to do things. Um, we are now five years old uh, company, a scale up originally from Helsinki, Finland, but we since have scaled uh, across the globe. We are today some 200 people strong team. Uh, we expect to double our headcount this year. So we are three seeing the super strong growth in the open source data uh, market as described earlier. We believe that open source really is the key for innovation and the progress across societies and obviously through the, for the companies as well. Uh, the community will always outpace innovation compared to a single company in the long run. And as described earlier, uh, the ability to build an open source that does not have a lock in will give a strategic choice and strategic opportunity for companies to take advantage, but also be free in the future to, to do other choices. Um, we have been really successful in the market and, and uh, uh, fortunate in a way that we have uh, got a really good customer base, but also we have got a really good uh, investor base to back up. So we just recently announced our C round investment of 100 million led by Atomico, and this gives us uh, substantial tools to really uh, further create our capabilities, which now will be available through Exascale in the market for, for the DBUS services. Uh, we, we have been a profound supporter for the open source, and we have also recently established a uh, open source uh, office within Ivan, really to promote and develop the community further. So, we want to be a proactive uh, participant in the community, really to give back, to, to really have everybody the opportunity to take advantage of the capabilities open source provides. And we believe this is the right method to deliver uh, data services today and in the future as well. And again, we are super excited to work together with Exascale on this and really looking forward for the uh, next uh, conferences and webinars to share more on the actual product capabilities. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. So Avon and Exascale, you will get more on that topic in the, in the near future and more services will be available um, in the future as well. 
and everything is based on open source with the benefits we just just described so what's what's coming up today a, a little bit of preparation for what's coming next and and will be shown live so there are different plan models available depending on for what purpose you want to use this certain database as a service so there's a hobbyist plan which is for, suitable for small applications uh, or getting into a new topic a uh, new database technology and then there are the the three main models like startup business and premium startup is for test environment business is for staging environment and premium is for production and what does it mean in numbers i, I tried to put that together as well have a look for the four uh, technologies we we make available today so the postgres sql database uh, first of all starting prices for those technologies varies because the technologies are, are quite different uh, from from um, data processing point of view uh, if you look at the at the nodes and and memory and, and storage numbers where you can scale up to it's also impressive uh, and all that with 99.99 availability so that's coming uh, that's here today for you for the test and I, I don't want to keep you longer from really seeing the product and that's why I will hand over to Dennis um, to, to, to the live event and that you see the product and thanks for, for taking the time to show up today and, and taking interest in our services. Thank you. Thank you Hans. So I'm a cloud solution architect at uh, A1 Digital and today I will show you how to easily create your application, your database, and how you can then easily use your database in your application. So this is still a preview. So we have to use the terminal, the console, but later on, you will have the ability to go to the interface of ActuScale, where you also can create virtual machines, and then just go there to databases, click on create database, and then your database will be there. So doing the same thing on the console is also easy, but we will use the exit tool. So the exit tool is a CLI tool you can download uh, as exit for Windows, or you can use your package manager to install it. So exo lab, because it's a preview, DB, and then let's list the types. So for now, for this preview, we make PostgreSQL available, Redis, Kafka, and Elasticsearch. Of course, more will come, like for example, MySQL. So I will create now a PostgreSQL database, but the steps are really the same for any database you wish to create. To create one, we use ExoLab DB create then what kind of database? So we want to create a PostgreSQL database. Then we have to specify a plan. I will use business eight. And then you have to think of a name for your database. Like in this case, we can use my database. So this doesn't take very long. And what actually happens is that the CLI talks with Exascale. Exascale in turn talks with, with Avon and says, hey, this customer wants to have a PostgreSQL database with this plan. And then Avon in turn creates a virtual machine hosted in Exascale, boots it up and installs the database on top. Also, we see it was created in Frankfurt because Frankfurt is the default zone, but you can also use any other zone actually. Yeah, we also see some more data. Like, for example, we see, okay, um, it consists of two nodes. So this database is highly available and it's actually replicated between two nodes. And every node has four CPUs and around nine gigabytes of memory. Also, this disk size is 188, and because uh, it has multiple nodes, it's currently in the rebuilding state, because, of course, those two nodes need to have 
the same state in the end. Yeah, I used the business aid plan, but let's also show the other plans. To do so, we can use Excel Lab DB types show and then PG for PostgreSQL again. And here we see the kind of different plans. So Hans explained it also a bit, but here we see now the details. So the startup plans only have one node. Basically, you use the startup plans when you're developing your application or when you just want to try it out. Of course, between those startup nodes or types, you can choose different performance characteristics like um, the amount of disk space or the amount of RAM. Let's scroll up a bit. And here we see the premium plans. So the premium plans actually have three replicated nodes, so it's really high available. Also, you probably noticed that this number at the end of the name is always the memory. Then we also see the business plans and the business plans have two nodes instead of three nodes, like in the premium plan. Okay, so I already created the database. It was uh, quite fast, but how to use it? To do so, we need a way to connect to it. Let's show how we can get a connection string. Excel lab db show minus u and then the name of the database. And we see it gives us the connection string which we can use in our application, like in our Java application, JavaScript application, whatever. And then we're basically ready to go. This connection string consists of the host name, as we see, the port, the name of the default database, and of course, the username and the admin password. So let's try to actually connect. So beforehand, I installed pgadmin and pgadmin is the official application if you want to connect to PostgreSQL and create or see some data. So let's create a new connection. So let's call it my cool connection. And then let's click on connection. So here we have to insert the host name. So let's copy this one out. Then the port, this one is 21699. The maintenance database, which will be the default database. The username, which is Avon admin. And then I will just copy the password. Okay, what we also have to do is we have to go on SSL and chose the SSL mode required. So security is very important for AVEN and for Exascale. And as such, AVEN will only allow you to connect via SSL. That means your connection is completely encrypted and also authenticated. That means on principle, you don't need any VPN to actually securely connect to your database. But of course, you also have the possibility to restrict the IP addresses which are able to connect. So you can say, okay, only this subnet of my company is allowed to connect. Or you can also create a gateway, actually, a gateway virtual machine, and then only restrict uh, to this gateway. There, of course, you can then install a VPN. Also, AVEN has other security measures. So we also always use encryption at rest. That means, your data will be always encrypted on the disk and it can't be accessed by anyone. So we specified everything. Let's try to connect. Okay, we see the connection works actually. And we can then click on this dashboard. And there we see, okay, we have some data like the transactions per second. And we see, okay, 
um, how many people are actually connected and of course one connection is even itself for maintenance. Well, we can uh, simply create a sample table. So let's click on here, create table, then call it my table, put in some columns like maybe one ID column and also let's create a text column. It's the data type Varcha or varying. And then let's click on save. And we see we just created a table. Of course, we can also query it. And of course, it's empty because it's a new database. We can then also insert something, save it. And then we see, OK, it's really easy to use the database. It's really easy to insert data. And also, it's really easy to actually connect to the database. But of course, you can specify much more parameters. So let's take a look at the parameters of the database. So we can use Excel Lab DB update, and then let's call the help text. Here we see then different parameters, which we can set. So, for example, we can set the maintenance window. So Avon, of course, does regular updates. And that means you can also specify when to do the updates. So you can say, for example, OK, let's use Sunday because on Sunday not a lot of people are connected. Or let's use Wednesday because on Wednesday there are always some employees there and um, they can take a look if something is not correct. There's also a termination protection right now. So we can, for example, say, OK, Excel Lab DB update and then the name of the database. And then termination protection true. So that means it's basically now protected from deletion. So we can try to do this. Excel Lab DB delete my database and yes we want really to try it and then we see okay we get a permission error and we get it because as we see the termination protection is actually set to true here of course we also see some more data like the plan and we can also change this plan so let's try this so let's use excel lab db update again and then plan and let's use premium eight instead of business eight. And there we see, okay, we changed the plan. It just took some seconds. So it's no problem for you to scale your plan. For example, you could start with a startup database to test it or to develop your application and later on when it's when it goes live, then you can just switch to the premium plan. Of course, we will also provide much more abilities to change configurations, like, for example, the IPs which are allowed to connect, but also detailed parameters of the database, like the cache size on PostgreSQL and so on. This will be all there then. Also, of course, everything is managed. And managed also means that AVEN automatically takes care of backups. So depending on the plan you choose, you have different amount of backups, which are all done automatically. So this is basically your current database, and these are your backups. Let's say you accidentally deleted a table. Well, what happens then? You can then just restore one of the backups. And restoring a backup works like this. You basically get a fork of the database. So you get an entirely new database. And this comes with some advantages. For example, you can then say, OK, I want to keep the latest state, but I will 
just transfer the deleted table from the fork to the current state. Of course, you can also say, okay, no, let's ditch the current state and just keep the fork, the current one. And so you basically have complete control of your data and how you want to actually use your backups. Also managed means that updates are managed. Like I said, Avon will always try to keep updates in the maintenance window. But of course, if there are critical zero day vulnerabilities, Avon will also react and then do the um, updates as fast as possible. And what happens there is that Avon will also create a fork and will test the updates first. And only when the updates work, then the connection will be switched from the head to the fork automatically. That means your connection will reset for like five seconds or so, but then they will get reconnected and they will all have then the new database version. So the only thing you have to ensure is actually that your application is able to automatically reconnect. So yes, this was my presentation. As you saw, everything's managed. You can just create your database, use your database, and you don't have to take care of anything. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, Hans, Dennis, and Ari for the insights around database as a service. In the meantime, we have received a ton of questions that we would like to answer in the Q&A session. As we still have around about 30 minutes for the Q&A session, Maybe uh, we can answer them all, but if we are not able to manage the questions, we catch up with you and also stay in touch with you. So, do we start the Q&A session? So everybody please, from the speakers, turn on the video and I will read out the questions we gathered to you all. So, the first questions um, is, for the PostgreSQL database, do you have point in time point in time recovery yes uh, supported by, by by default on uh, postgres thank you very much the second one is can we create more than two nodes in a postgres sql cluster more than one replica I'll take also this one. So yes, and uh, as I speak, you should be able also to go directly to uh, exoscale.com slash db as dbas. And here you'll find, um, this is the first version, but uh, find the list of the services. And for each uh, service, you will find um, the specifications of the plans and the uh, number of replica, number of nodes, depending on the technology. Um, so if we, if I remember correctly, if you go uh, for Postgres and you shoot for premium plans, you'll have actually two replicas uh, running. So the, 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 the data durability is quite high. Thank you. The next question is, what the IOPS limits? Different limits for different plans, startup versus business and etc. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so the so all the plans. Um, what you get with uh, Exoscale DB as a service is is I mean the best the the, the mix of uh, of um, two things. Huh? It's the mix of the uh, automation uh, database platform from Avon and the solid performance infrastructure from uh, from exoscale so all the plans you'll see run on um, uh, vm sizing uh, that you are already familiar with if you're an exoscale customer so uh, they absolutely match to the performance that uh, we already run on our current um, compute generations um, so the, as you scale up you'll get more and more memory uh, and of course, uh, uh, storage performance. Um, 
when you say when you size up or down the plans, also the number of connections. For example, if you take a, a database like Postgres, will go up and down. So I mean, if with a smaller plan, you have less parallel connections possible, uh, of course, because the the number of resources are are limited. But remember that all the plans are dedicated VM instances that run exclusively um, your database engine. It's nothing is shared. Uh, so it, it goes from, if, you, if it's an obvious plan, it's uh, one single VM and then can scale up. You take a, uh, an elastic search cluster, they can scale up, up to 30 nodes uh, in the plans we have listed currently. Thank you. The next question is, do we get access to the PG underline HBA file? Um, so I don't think you get access to the file, but you'll get access. We haven't documented this yet, um, but there's a lot of tunables for each technology that you can set uh, via the uh, at launch or via the update process that uh, Dennis just uh, showed. Uh, so for example, uh, if you want to restrict the uh, connection IPs uh, uh, that uh, uh, someone can connect to uh, from a, to, to a database, uh, you can do so, uh, no problem. Thank you. The next question, I think it's also related to Antoine. Uh, is there a time and timeline date for the launch of MySQL support? Aha, good question. Uh, uh, jump on, on on the preview and uh, start start testing uh, using Postgres. What I can say is that um, all the services, uh, and that's what's great with Aven, they, they behave with the same concept. So if you, I mean, test drive Postgres, you can expect the MySQL to behave just the same. Um, and yeah, we are working hard together to make this available in the in the weeks to come. Uh, so expect to to hear back from us, but I, I won't commit to a specific date. Thank you. The next question is, can you define the backup frequency? Uh, so the backup frequency, depending on the technology plan, uh, so it goes, goes up and down with the, with the plan. Um, I think we have a we have started to document there uh, this in the tables, uh, but expect also the documentation to be much more uh, detailed as we reach the, as we reach GA uh, with uh, like limitations, really detailed uh, uh, specs with each plan uh, and etc. Thank you. A new question coming in: Can I install extensions in Postgres? Do you offer a couple of extensions or can I even install my own extensions like Citus or Timescale DB? Um, so yes, but we haven't tested this yet, uh, but even does support um, and Exoscale DB as a service powered by even will support uh, things like uh, Timescale or um, geographical uh, data, so post GIS. Um, so please reach out to any of our cloud architects and we will be happy to test drive this with you. Thank you. I think a most general question is, when will exactly database as a service reach general availability? We already uh, are giving you a, a meeting for September 7th. Uh, where we expect to have reach or be close to, to reach uh, GA. GA really means for us that we are 100% enforcing our SLAs, that the platform is fully documented. Uh, so answering all the questions, so you should be able to find that in, in, in our docs um, uh, until then. And also that additional tools from the CLI are made available. So that means that you could provision uh, services from the portal, but also from our Terraform providers, um, so, so to make a complete experience. That's uh, that's when we define we we reach uh, GA. 
Thank you. Are there database logs accessible? Yes, there will be, there is an API call for accessing uh, database logs uh, and uh, um, yeah, it's part of the usual operation uh, toolkit, I would say. And the next question, one by one coming in. <laughs> so you're very expensive. Is there some read-write split mechanism for master-slave databases? Legacy apps need to have such a feature because they are not built with such a scaling logic. So, Denis, if you want to answer that, uh, that's out of my out of my league. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not sure either. So we have to come back to you. Okay. Next question is, can we get database as a service in our organization's private network? A good question, tricky question. Um, so no, um, so, so the, the services we provide um, are, like I said before, completely dedicated. So they're private and restricted to your organization and nothing is shared. Um, uh, but they are accessible and they will be accessible through the Exoscale uh, uh, public network. Um, so we don't have uh, an immediate plan to deploy uh, Exoscale DB as a service into your own organization's uh, private networks. Uh, maybe it's a 2022 topic, uh, but not on the road, not on the immediate roadmap. But of course, you can create a gateway because you're able to restrict the IP addresses. And as such, you can create a gateway in the private network and then use this one. And like also Dennis explained, everything is encrypted end to end, also in transit uh, and at rest, um, which means, I mean, you should really consider the, the, the trade off because, I mean, having um, Exoscale DB as a service fully automated. Um, enables the forks, enables those migrations. I mean, you you access the database with a URL, uh, not with a fixed IP. Um, so that's what's make the, I mean, even automation and the lifecycle management uh, what it is and and relieves the, the pain of uh, managing databases at, at scale. There's something coming in with uh, two questions. Um, he's asking, I think you mentioned it, but how do you handle upgrades? First, minor Postgres upgrades, patch updates like 13.0 to 13.1. And the second question is, how do you handle major versions upgrades like from Postgres 13 to 14? Is there downtime necessary? So uh, downtime is uh, generally not necessary because, like I said, uh, there will be always a fork created, and then you have uh, you can just basically reconnect um, to the app. So you have a downtime of like realistically five seconds, maybe ten seconds. And for minor upgrades, it's like that that it will be always try to keep in the maintenance window. And for um, major upgrades, you will possibly have like to from 13 to 14, the possibility of operating near the CLI. Next question is, um, so a database is running on a shared server. Is it possible a high load database server from a different customer decreases the performance of my database? Well, uh it's i mean it's not shared meaning there's there's only one database engine running on your database server or or database cluster okay so so the virtual machine running this is not shared of course the virtual machine is running in the overall exoscale environment uh noisy neighbor is something that i mean can happen um, but uh, yes, if you see any decrease in performance, feel free. I mean, that's also part of uh, the Exoscale support in, uh, in SLA. So you can always reach out to us and um, we uh, we would uh, investigate. Uh, but we, it's our job to make this uh, the most transparent possible for your operations. Thank you. 
Next question, is there a way to provide monitoring for a database? Let's take Postgres, e.g. Uh, RAM usage. I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> we will get back to you. Yes. There's a, price, uh, there's a question on pricing. I, we can maybe go through. Yeah, we'll take that as the next one. Uh, will you store the Postgres backups in the same data center? Can I move the backups to a different data center? What if your data center burns down? Like the, let's keep it out, another one does it really neatly. Um, do you want to do, do it, Dennis? Uh, re explain the fork? Yes, but I'm uh, not sure about uh, the location of the backups. Ah, so the location is in the same. And and so you could start a new you you could start from backup in a, in another one. I expect full documentation on this on the in the weeks to come. I think the question uh, you were referring to, Antoine, was that um, the database price that we saw before is also for the infrastructure buys, um, prices included. Yeah, exactly. I um, wanted to. So everything you see now from the slides or on the website is um, the price for the full uh, thing. So the managed database part, including the the infrastructure. Um, so, so it's uh, all in, and of course, it's like we, like everything we, we've done previously. It's uh, uh, on demand, so you pay per use. Uh, so this, uh, the unit is the hourly pricing. Thank you. The next question is: And do you have any API or way to access S3 buckets, or any other way to load big data set? So I'm not sure if this is meant separately from uh, the uh, database uh, as a service, uh, but uh, of course our S3 has an API and uh, you can also, for example, uh, migrate uh, your current database from anywhere uh, to our database as a service. And I think if it's in relation of the database platform, it will be very specific to the relevant engines, so like for example, Postgres S3 works well, uh, but others uh, don't have much capabilities. Um, so, so it's really a specific. Thank you. The next question is, can I download a backup to store it myself? Mm -hmm. We'll need to check on how to do that. Seems like a good question. <laughs> it is. Well, I mean, yeah, for for Postgres, you can always do a dump. Um, but um, since the, the the backup mechanism works a bit different than the traditional backup um, with the fork, I'm not sure you can. Like, if you mean the download the backup of what really uh, uh, Exoskeleton DPS service uh, um, backup strategy runs on. Thank you. The next question is more to the zones. Um, is it available in all zones? Yes, there's no restrictions. So um, as we go forward, every service, every plan we publish um, is available in uh, in all zones. So you just have to specify when you when you create your service where you want it to start, and it will stay there and then run there. Until uh, until you delete it, that's part of our guarantee as well. Also in terms of uh, data location and uh, uh, keeping data where it's uh, meant to be. I think the next question follows that one. Regarding backup locations, can a backup be automatically stored in another exascale zone and started there as a disaster recovery? Do 
automatically no, but this is something you can easily automate. So <laughs> uh, let's let's see as we move um, further with our with our Terraform uh, development. If that, that could be a, a nice example. Okay. So I think the next question is uh, for cash. Do you have special dedicated disks for cash? So very specific to the database technology because it's not relevant everywhere. Um, and if we talk about the, um, the at the infrastructure level, um, so, so like I said before, it's using the current flavors of uh, um, exoskeleton compute, um, where we don't make distinction. I mean, the, the what we provide is um, the, the SSD storage um, with a, a nice performance level. Uh, so that's what's used currently to power all the plants. So Thank no you. special dedicated disk device or, or whatsoever. Talking about backups, there's another question coming in uh, about backups in France. A data says is burned down. If that happens to you, all my data would be gone. Question mark. No data. My company is out of business. So that's hey, uh, basically disaster yeah, recovery yeah. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's basically the same uh, question. So we will come back to you. Oh, but see. generally, cloud providers. I mean, OVH, Exoscale, uh, Amazon. We provide a toolkit, a toolbox. We provide infrastructure. I mean, it's and we cannot know upfront what customers will be using. Some, I mean, are totally fine with uh, um, having everything in one place. Um, others and most uh, for production workload should have a uh, data protection strategy, um, but it's very, very difficult to impose one uh, that works well with the application la layer and with the data that's uh, that's being hosted by the customer. Um, so that's why, I mean, us as infrastructure provider, we it's very difficult to make choices on behalf of uh, of uh, of the customers of the data controllers regarding this so yes please do think about your disaster recovery strategy we provide six zones we we're always open to 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 expand uh, and uh, i think today the technologies are in place to uh, copy right to many distributed data where uh, possible and where uh, relevant Thank you very much. As I can see, and I um, checked the questions, we are going to double the questions. So if there are no um, further questions coming in, or even if we missed some questions, we didn't answer it in the Q&A session, we will catch up with you, of course, um, afterwards personally. So with this, I would like to close the Q&A session. And I would like to say many thanks to our speakers and their openness in answering the questions. Likewise, I thank our large audience and all the questions for the privilege of your time. And a final note, you will receive tomorrow during the day the address documents and the recording by mail. Another announcement for you to stay in touch will be the next webinar for the general availability hardware, like Antoine mentioned in the beginning at the 7th of September. On that note, I wish you a pleasant rest of the working day and see you soon in the next webinar. Thank you very much, guys.